five, four, three, two. Good evening and welcome to the November 2nd, 2020 regular meeting of the mayor and city council. First item on our agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance and I am going to ask council member Neil Harris to lead us in the pledge tonight. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, of their God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Neil. Uh, next item on our agenda is reflection, and I wanted to make a short statement uh, regarding the election. Um, on the eve of election day, I want to note that for a lot of people, tomorrow and perhaps the ne next several days will be filled with tension and gut-wrenching, toe-clenching anxiety. Uh, and maybe everything goes your way, maybe it doesn't. More likely, it's gonna be a mixed bag that often happens in a democracy. Um, it's in the spirit of our city's proud tradition of civility that I offer the following perspective. If your candidate or ballot issue wins, have some compassion for the ardent supporters of the other side. A win is not a cause for gloating, it's a cause for magnanimity. And if you're on the losing end, don't give up hope, reflect, learn the lessons that are there to be learned and turn it into something constructive because there will always be more elections. Either way, the aftermath of an election is a time for grace and charity the end of the day, we are friends, we are neighbors, we are a community, and ultimately we're on the same team. So as we go into a moment of silence, uh, we go into it with the fond wish that the aftermath of this election and of all elections will be governed by, and I borrow a beautiful phrase from Abraham Lincoln, the better angels of our nature. Let's have a moment of silence, please. Thank you all very much. Next on our agenda is approval of minutes and we have one set of minutes uh, to approve. Neil, I see your hand up. Yes, I thought I'd approve them since I did the Pledge of Allegiance at this one as well, uh, seemed appropriate. I'd like to move approval of the minutes for Monday, October 5th, 2020. Okay, Mike. Yeah, I will second that with a correction to the section on uh, ordinances and resolutions, uh, item B, uh, the, the resolution authorizing amendment of the design and build contract for Robertson Park Field number three. I had asked specifically whether the city had a grant from Project Open Space in which the funding could only be used for that field. Uh, that's not reflected in the minutes and I would like to have that uh, and staff answered affirmatively that we would lose that uh, project open space money if we did not uh, move forward with this plan. So I think it was somewhere around $500,000. But uh, if that can be verified uh, as to the amount that I would like to have the minutes reflect uh, the question and the response from staff on that section. Neil, are you amenable to that amendment? I am amenable to that amendment. Okay, uh, well then I will call the roll. Uh, we have a motion, a second, and a second for a, a, an amended version of the minutes. Uh, all those in favor say aye, any opposed say nay. Uh, Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. And Council Member Wu. Aye. All right, carries unanimously. Um, Next on our agenda is the employee recognition for the second quarter of 2020. And I'd like to turn it over to city manager, Tanisha Briley. Thank you, Mayor. I am excited about keeping uh, this honeymoon rolling where I show up to the city, I get to cut ribbons, make huge economic development announcements and recognize employees. I couldn't have asked for uh, a better opening few weeks here with the city of Gaithersburg. Um, obviously these extraordinary times require extraordinary talent. And I am so fortunate to have inherited one of the best teams in the country 
And tonight I get to officially brag about a few of them as I'm pleased to present the second quarter employee recognition award to Jimmy Frazier Bay and the COVID Carpentry team winners for 2020. So they were nominated by their peers and the final selections were made by the Employee Recognition Committee, which is comprised of employees from each city department. Before I introduce our winners, I'd like to thank the members of the Employee Recognition Committee team for their efforts in keeping this important process going, as this is even more important, especially now. So now a little bit about our second quarter winners. Jimmy Frazier Bay is the Division Manager for Homeless Services within the Department of Community and Public Relations, as well as the Director of the Wells Robertson House. He was nominated for his dedication and commitment to the city's homeless population. Jimmy works tirelessly to support the residents of the Wells Robertson House, which of course is the city's transitional program for homeless men and women in recovery and to keep the facility operating at its full potential. Additionally, Jimmy often partners with his colleagues and other providers to offer programs and services such as providing breakfast for the unsheltered homeless residents. Despite the ongoing pandemic, Jimmy continues to carry out this vital work. I had the privilege of meeting with Jimmy just last week and learned that he not only does all of this amazing work for us and how lucky we are to have him, he is also a graduate of the Wells Robertson House, and I think it is a true testament of the work of that program and his commitment and passion uh, to us, to the city, and to the residents there. The second set of winners is the COVID Carpentry Team. Uh, this team is comprised of facilities and equipment technicians Paul Morgan and Paul Hill, so the Paul team. The team was nominated for their efforts to modify areas within city facilities to better protect staff and the public from COVID-19. These two staff members designed, constructed, and installed safety barriers and COVID-19 related signage at multiple city facilities. They spent three months working on pandemic related modifications while continuing to handle regularly scheduled projects such as preparing the mini golf and skate park to open for the season and repainting rooms at the Benjamin Gaither Senior Center. Best expressed in a direct quote from one of the nominations, they embody what it means to take pride in and care about what they do for the city. I got to see their work firsthand. Uh, most of this work had been done prior to my arrival at the city. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I got a request from staff to add some uh, partitions for our front desk staff, uh, those who take the permits and speak to uh, visitors to City Hall. And I, I want to say within two hours of my approval of that, they were already there measuring and, and putting uh, plexiglass in. And, so, and their work was flawless and it looks great and it was done quickly. So we want to thank Paul Morgan and Paul Hill and Jimmy Frazier Bay for their service to the city and congratulations. That's all for me, Mayor. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, the council and I are extremely proud of our staff and the, the work they've done. Uh, and it's certainly noticeable, any facility you walk into, you see that the carpentry work, um, you know, we're, we're really grateful to them for their conscientious work and, and congratulate them. And, and I, I, the only regret we have is that we can't do this in person and, and have them at the meeting and hand hand uh, the you know the certificate to them. Um, so next on our agenda is public comments, and I'm look I'm going to look right now and see. I am not seeing any members of the public signed into this meeting. So then we're going to move right into from the mayor and, and city council. And the, the first tonight is going to be Council Member Spiegel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for your thoughtful comments uh, during reflection at the beginning of the meeting. Um, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, everybody should know that tomorrow is Election Day 2020. And uh, I'm sure I speak for all of my colleagues when I say vote, vote, vote. If you haven't voted yet, um, obviously early voting ended today. So tomorrow, if you're going in person, 
uh, either go to your uh, precinct, your polling precinct to vote, uh, or if you have a mail ballot uh, that you'd like to return in person, you can drop it at the Board of uh, Elections or at um, any of the secure official uh, drop boxes. Uh, we have several of those around the city and in areas outside the city as well. Uh, just make sure that you vote or you drop off your ballot before 8 p.m. And if you are in line by 8 p.m. to vote, uh, you are allowed to vote, even if it takes you a little while to get from uh, that start of the line all the way through the polling place. So don't leave as long as you're in line by 8 o'clock. And hopefully, uh, I'm pretty confident everything's going to run pretty smoothly in Montgomery County and throughout the state of Maryland. Uh, but I want to say this. Um, a lot of people say, oh, Maryland is not a swing state, and therefore my vote is not as important in a big national election like this. Your vote is important. Your vote is always important. And I also want to draw everyone's attention uh, to the fact that we've got a number of items on our state and local ballot this year that are of great importance to our community as well including things like uh, elections or uh, decisions about whether to keep local judges and state judges, uh, proposed amendments to our state constitution, and important um, discussions about proposed amendments to our county charter, which could change the way uh, that we are represented um, as uh, residents of the county. So please, please make sure that you go out and vote. Every election is important. This one is particularly important and we need everyone to be counted regardless of what your position ultimately is on any of these issues on the ballot or which candidates you support or oppose. Please, please, please go out and vote. This is so important. We're seeing the high turnout in lots of other states and, and news coverage of that, um, but uh, we cannot uh, let that be an excuse uh, for us here in Maryland to stay home. Uh, so we hope uh, to see all of you who are eligible uh, at the polls uh, tomorrow if you haven't already voted. Um, I want to um, add my congratulations to the employees who were recognized by the city manager this evening for their excellent work. We appreciate you. Um, and um, I wanted, I hope I don't steal the mayor's thunder here, but I just, since I was the first one called on, I guess I get the opportunity to say this. Uh, we've already shared it on social media today. I wanted to uh, congratulate everyone involved in the big announcement about the expansion of Novavax, an important biotechnology company headquartered here in the city of Gaithersburg in our biotech hub, uh, which uh, was announced today uh, in a joint press release with the governor uh, and the state um, and the county and the city uh, and Novavax, the company, uh, to talk about a major expansion that they are already um, working on to bring hundreds of additional high quality jobs in the biotech sector right here to Gaithersburg. Most of those just in the next uh, three to five months. Um, and this will be an incredible investment of many, many, many millions of dollars and the creation of, of many, many great jobs right here in Gaithersburg, strengthening the ecosystem that we already have here uh, for biotechnology. And in particular, Novavax is one of the leading contenders for um, a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, among other leading contenders who also happen to be right here in the city of Gaithersburg. And we're very proud of them. And as the mayor said earlier today, we are rooting them on uh, and looking forward to working with them to help um, support uh, this expansion and this big economic development victory for our city and our local economy and our community. Um, I wanted to just uh, note, um, and Mayor Ashman will appreciate this, I got a little uh, LinkedIn uh, reminder that this week uh, is 13 years that he and I have served together um, on the city council and including his time as mayor. He and I both came on uh, in November of uh, 2007. Uh, it's been a pretty wild ride. So uh, I just thought that was a, a nice anniversary to mark. And um, just wanted to briefly mention a few events that I was able to attend virtually over the course of the last several days. Um, the Frederick County chapter of the Maryland Municipal League held a virtual chapter meeting uh, on October 22nd and invited me as the past statewide president of MML to come and speak to them a little bit about my experience 
uh, as president uh, during uh, the pandemic and all the other challenges uh, that we've dealt with over the course of the last year, year and a half. So I appreciate their invitation and it was a good discussion. Um, on October 30th, uh, there was a little farewell uh, virtual happy hour for our good friend, Candace Donahoe, uh, who has spent the last 20 years um, as the um, chief legislative advocacy officer for MML uh, in Annapolis, helping to represent us and all of our fellow cities and towns as we uh, advocate for and against legislation uh, at the state level. Uh, Candace retired on the 31st. Uh, she tried to retire a few times earlier and we wouldn't let her. So we had a great opportunity to celebrate her and to thank her. I believe uh, Council Member Sesma and Council Vice President Sales were on the call. Um, I know that uh, Deputy City Manager Enslinger was on the call. So a number of us from Gaithersburg, in addition to uh, friends and colleagues around the state, were able to properly honor Candace. And I just want to again thank her for her friendship and her great work for the last 20 years on behalf of Gaithersburg and all municipalities in Maryland. I also wanna thank um, the communities in the city um, who worked really hard to pull off what at least in my neighborhood was an incredibly successful socially distanced Halloween on Saturday night. Um, people really followed guidance about putting out candy in a way that was distanced flat out on tables in front of their houses if necessary, pack pre-packaging candies in bags so the kids wouldn't have to all reach into the same bucket and spread germs. Uh, all kinds of creative things that people did. We, we saw some very elaborate shoots uh, where people were putting the candy in in the second story window and it was coming out on the first floor for the kids. Lots of really clever and creative things, but the spirit of community was really alive and well on Saturday night. Um, while we all stayed safe and followed all the rules, uh, we got to have a little bit of normalcy and fun. And I just want to appreciate all the uh, folks in the communities uh, who, who made that happen. Um, all of the guidance from the county, uh, which was relayed by city staff uh, to give people proper information on how to do that safely. Um, and it, it just really turned out to be a lovely evening. I hope the rest of you had a similar experience. Finally, uh, normally on November 11th, we would do a Veterans Day ceremony in person, but obviously we can't this year. Um, so I just want to take a moment um, to thank all of our veterans out there uh, for your service and your sacrifice and encourage everyone to watch what we're going to package as a sort of pre-recorded video tribute uh, to our veterans that we will circulate on social media and our city website and other uh, media channels uh, on November 11th uh, to honor them and to recognize Veterans Day. And that's all I've got this evening. Vote, vote, vote. Thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, just a couple notes before we go to Lori Ann. Um, happy anniversary. I think this is, so it's our 13th. That means that we're around the time of Mike's 15th. Um, and uh, this will be an anniversary for Lori Ann and for Rob, not for Neil, because Neil came in in December uh, as, as an appointment originally. So his anniversary would be next month. And um, in terms of Halloween, it, you know, I appreciate what your neighborhood did. I, I saw other, uh, other uh, neighborhoods doing similarly. Uh, but I will note that while if there was some diminishment of actual trick-or-treating, which there surely was, um, there, it, the energy was put into decorations. Like that, there were some amazingly elaborate, awesome decorations in, in in and around my neighborhood that I that I saw in, in other places. So anyway, let's go to Lori Ann. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, Ryan has uh, mentioned quite a bit of uh, updates, so I'll just add a few more <laughs> and I'll keep my remarks brief. Um, I too uh, was able to um, participate in um, uh, augmented Halloween car parade, um, a given treat for Halloween where we collected some uh, uh, non-perishable food items from attendees and uh, gave out treat bags um, for anyone who participated. So looking forward to uh, continuing to collect food for families in need as we near the Thanksgiving holidays. Um, 
So thank you to the uh, Rotary Club of Washington Global uh, Montgomery County Satellite for hosting this event. It was at the uh, Orchard Park community. Um, and we were joined by uh, uh, Kavanaugh of Cool and Dope and his mom, uh, Lacey. So special thanks to both of them for hosting this event. Um, congratulations again to the carpentry team um, and Jimmy Frazier Bay for their outstanding work on behalf of the city. Um, I also um, attended some other events last week. Um, the Complete Count Committee for Montgomery County, they celebrated uh, all of the census results. Um, since we ended on the 16th, uh, Maryland finished ninth in the nation. So we should all give ourselves a round of applause since uh, we had one of our census champions, um, Lauren Sukul, who participated. Um, Britta was also at the meeting. So special thanks to everyone involved in the census. Um, and I did get to vote, early vote yesterday. And I just enjoyed uh, just walking around the Bower Park lobby to uh, look at the uh, Why I Vote exhibit. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, I'll post some pictures after the meeting, um, just some beautiful artwork. Um, and this has been going on since the summer in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage movement. So if you haven't had a chance, I think it's gonna be there for about two more weeks. And there's also a Day of the Dead altar exhibit as well that's going to be there for a little bit longer. Um, you just get to peek in at it, but both uh, really beautiful exhibits. Um, so thank you to um, our Parks and Recs Department and everyone else involved in putting that together. Uh, perfectly appropriate for the times that we're in and uh, encouraging everyone to get out and vote. And I want to give a big thank you to all of the volunteers, all of the poll watchers uh, for sacrificing and serving um, during the pandemic, during this important election. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, looking forward to seeing the results in the end of this presidential election. So thank you. Thank you, Lorianne. We'll go to Rob. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll just echo all the sentiments expressed um, and tell people or ask people, urge people, beg people, go vote. Um, that's all. Okay, thank you, Rob. We'll go to Neil. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks everybody for your comments. Uh, it makes my list much shorter. Um, for those of you who are waiting till the last minute to vote, I hope to see you at the polls tomorrow. I expect to be hanging around in the afternoon, offering my support and thanks for everybody for coming to vote. As, as has been said many times, it's a very important election, not just the presidential election, but we have a, a congressman who's is up for election this year. We have uh, two statewide and four countywide uh, initiatives that are on the ballot as well. So hopefully you're looking at those and the other races that are, uh, that are on the ballot and making good choices. Um, in the last couple of weeks, um, I made the, uh, had the opportunity to give a tour of parts of Gaithersburg to a second group from Leadership Montgomery. I did one the month before. Uh, the first one was for the, uh, uh, for the senior group and this was for the core group, but got to show them around my neighborhood in the Kentlands. And by the way, thanks to uh, County Councilman Gabe Albernoz for coming uh, and speaking to that same group before uh, before my part, uh, joining us in Gaithersburg and talking about countywide issues. But I uh, had a chance to talk about how we do housing in Gaithersburg and show people how we do it in Kentlands and talk about other new urbanist developments and other opportunities. So had a couple of beautiful days, a little bit nicer than the last couple. Uh, and the group was appreciative and we all got a little fresh air and exercise while we were at it. Um, attended the Transportation Planning Board meeting this last month and uh, was presented the uh, once every 10 years survey of people's commuting patterns um, full of information. I'm not going to quote a lot of the facts and figures at this meeting and I'm sure that you're all grateful for that, but 
if you're interested in seeing that data, I know Rob is grateful. Um, if you're interested in seeing the information, I've posted it to my Facebook pages. Um, you know, uh, it's important that we understand how people are commuting so we can make better plans as we go forward. So that's really the idea. Uh, and finally, I know it's been publicized throughout the Kentlands community, but unfortunately, um, a couple of years ago, we had an incident where a resident spread rat poison in his property to deal with squirrels. I don't know why squirrels were that much of an issue, but apparently it happened again. Uh, thanks very much to Kevin Roman for very fast action. As soon as the city staff was notified, Kevin and his team were out and uh, hopefully nipped this one in the bud. Um, hopefully the the person who is responsible, who is, is probably the same one who did this last time, but is not clear yet, um, is dealt with appropriately, and that this does not happen again. Uh, personally, I have a I have a three month old puppy, and I would prefer to keep him around for a while and not uh, take any risks. And this person and this issue happened very near the lakes where a lot of people walk. So, for those of you who don't live in Kentlands and hadn't heard. Uh, but if you come to Kentlands to walk your dog around the lakes, be careful for the next little while till we are sure that this is cleared up. Anyway, uh, as has been said multiple times, please go vote and let's hope for the best tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And thank you know, shout out to Kevin Roman for doing an amazing job as usual. Let's go to Council Member Sesma. Okay, <clears throat> I have a, an announcement first before my remarks. Uh, the city of Gaithersburg is seeking residents to serve on an ad hoc mayor and city council compensation review committee. Every four years, an ad hoc committee is formed and charged with reviewing the compensation of elected officials of other jurisdictions in the region, examining the current workload of the Gaithersburg mayor and city council and making recommendations for compensation adjustments as appropriate. The committee is also charged with reviewing and recommending adjustments to stipends for the Planning Commission, the Board of Appeals, and Historic District Commission members. The ad hoc committee's recommendations are advisory in nature, and the Mayor and City Council have the option of accepting, rejecting, or modifying those recommendations. It's anticipated that appointments will be made on November 16th, 2020, to this committee. The committee's recommendations are anticipated to come before the Mayor and City Council in March 2021. To be considered, please send a letter of interest and a resume to Mayor and City Council Services via email to mccservices at gaithersburgmd.gov or to Gaithersburg City Hall, 31 South Summit Avenue, Gaithersburg, Maryland, 20877. The deadline for submission uh, is November 6, 2020. For more information about serving on this uh, ad hoc committee, please contact Human Resources Director Kim Yocklin, kim.yocklin, Y-O-C-K-L-I-N, at gaithersburgmd.gov, or you can phone 301-258-6327, or visit the city's website, www.gaithersburgmd.gov. Uh, so I, you know, I had prepared remarks, but I'm convinced that uh, Ryan was looking over my shoulder and used all of them. So um, I'll just uh, echo the remarks of, of everybody and say vote, vote, vote. Uh, the polls are closing in two minutes. Uh, the early voting polls are closing in two minutes uh, throughout uh, the state. Uh, we have vote, there are voting centers, uh, the polling places have changed this year. Everyone will vote in a voting center. And there, there are two within the city of Gaithersburg and uh, two just outside the city. Uh, the activity center will be a voting center. The, uh, Gaithersburg High School will be a voting center. Quince Orchard High School will be a voting center. And Watkins Mill High School will be a voting center. So your regular polling places in past uh, general elections uh, are not available any longer. You'll vote at the voting center. So one of the things you can do at the voting center is Maryland passed same day voter registration. So if you're not registered to vote, but you still want to exercise your right to vote, you can register and then cast your ballot uh, tomorrow. 
polls open at seven o'clock, they close at eight o'clock. So I encourage, we encourage you and ask you and plead with you, like uh, my colleague said, to exercise your franchise. This is your right. Uh, it is a right to vote. And we hope that you uh, use it and don't let that vote go unwasted. So uh, finally, ha happy All Saints Day or uh, Day of the Dead. Uh, again, I'll remark, uh, Lorianne shared the uh, the fact that uh, there is an ofrenda or an altar uh, uh, to uh, remember those who have gone before us and crossed over. Uh, and that's in the uh, Activity Center at Boer Park. It's, it's uh, I think this is the third or fourth year that we've done this. The artists come in and set it up and it's just a, a great display. If you're not aware of the custom, you can certainly go uh, just Google Day of the Dead Ofrenda or Day of the Dead Altars, and you'll hear a lot about it. So um, it's nice to, uh, to have that again in the city. So again, don't forget to vote. Polls open at seven o'clock. Exercise your right to vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and I want to echo all the comments from everybody. Um, I want to take a little time and add add to what Ryan brought up about Novavax um, and what a big win it was for the city and just point out that it wasn't like we woke up one day and just got the news from Novavax that they're doing this it actually so many things had to come together in order to get us to this place and a lot of it is to the credit of our staff first off our economic development staff uh, uh, manage and administer uh, a number of different economic development incentive programs to help attract and retain employers and employees and, and jobs in the city. It, it, it was seven or eight years ago that they, uh, that I guess Novavax was in the market and they were looking around and, you know, the city, the, it, Tom Lonergan and, and Sharon Disk have their vetting system that they go through um, and they correctly adjudged uh, Novavax to be a company worthy of city investment to get them here. That was seven or eight years ago. That's that sort of set the stage. Uh, even in January of this year, no one had any inkling that Novavax would, would be ripe for such an expansion, but it turned out that when COVID hit, the type of respiratory ailment that COVID is at its root is a specialty of Novavax. And so they already had what they call a platform to begin with to, to start developing the, uh, the vaccine and treatment for COVID. And so once that happened, they, they got their wheels rolling and, and then they got this big giant grant from the federal government, the $1.6 billion. And the point of that grant is so that while they're taking this vaccine through testing, they can also at the same time be manufacturing. It's, a, it's essentially the federal government's taking away the risk that a company would normally face uh, during testing that the test isn't gonna work out, which is why companies go through testing first and then manufacture. They're saying, okay, let's assume it's working. Let's do, go through the manufacturing while we're doing the testing. So that way, if, if and when the testing comes out well, um, then we can immediately have the, have the vaccine ready to distribute. Well, Novavax has, has $1.6 billion and they have the facility on First Field Road, but they need it bigger. Um, and they needed to do something really, really quick. And so um, it, wasn't just the, it wasn't just the city of Gaithersburg they were looking at. There were other communities that were competing to get this expansion and they came to us with a nearly impossible demand. And I know this because I was on, I was on the initial phone call uh, with a number of our staff from legal to, um, to economic development, to our planning staff. And when they explained what they needed in the timeline that they needed it, I almost came away thinking, wow, I mean, this would be amazing to get in the city of Gatesburg. I don't know how we could possibly make this happen um, and go through the the process and the, 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 the permitting that we need to do as a city, but our planning staff um, and our legal staff and our economic de development staff work together in concert so quickly um, and so effectively that we won and we, and we you know, just so happened that there was a, a, a great big building at 700 Quince Orchard 
that was being refurbished and, and would, would be uh, ready around that time and, and also has a big out parcel that they, they can further develop another manufacturing uh, facility. Uh, anyway, a lot of things had to come together. This was not, this was not just waking up and to, to extreme good fortune. And here we have, uh, you know, ultimately at least 400 new jobs. Uh, it, it's just, and, and a great company we can all be proud of that's, that's racing against the clock to try to save the world. It's just, it could, it couldn't be any better. And I want to, I want to take our collective hat off to all the staff that just would not stop until we figured out a way to make this happen. It's remarkable and we're extremely lucky. Uh, so I wanna say that and Tanisha, I hope you'll convey it at, at, at the senior leadership team, make sure everybody understands just how proud and appreciative we are of all who had a hand in this. Um, and then um, I will note that next week, uh, we're doing something a little different. Our meeting will start at 7 p.m. instead of 7.30, and it will be a different kind of meeting. We're having our council in the community meeting. Rather than our work session, we're doing a council in the community meeting. And what this is, is uh, we will have representatives from most of our departments, uh, at least our public-facing departments, to um, speak, it sort, of, sort of reintroduce uh, the way that each, that, that each of our, the different arms of the city serve you. Um, this is something we normally do. We call it council in the communities because we usually go out to the community to um, to meet to meet people who we don't normally see at city council meetings. Um, but here we are in pandemic times, and we've put those on hold for for most of the year. And it's time we do one, and this one will be open to everybody. Um, and so the, the, uh, the meeting will work a little differently. There will be a presentation from each department, then members of the public can ask questions uh, or make comments, and then we'll go on to the next department. And we'll, we'll see how efficiently we can do it, but we're, we're gonna start at 7 p.m. Uh, next Monday, November 9th, and we hope you can join us. And please encourage everybody in the city to join us. It will, it will sort of, it'll be a refresher uh, to a lot of people, even people who, are, who sort of follow the city and think they understand all how it works, I bet you're gonna learn something. So um, so please join us and encourage your friends and neighbors to join us. And we will go to from the city manager, Tanisha. Well, I would say that mayor and council did a remarkable job of covering all the topics this evening. Uh, I don't think I have anything to add except my necklace says vote if you can't see that there. So I will add my, uh, my also encouragement to those who have not already done so to please cast their ballots tomorrow or drop them off. Um, there are lots of uh, community organizations that are working to transport people to the polls to uh, pick up your ballot and drop it off for you. There are so many ways to get this done. And if you uh, are at a loss and, and, and not sure what to do, just give us a call at City Hall and we will surely um, help you uh, make sure that your voice is heard tomorrow. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone on the other side on Wednesday, no matter what that means for you. We, we still have work to do in this city and, and I'm glad to be a part of this team and we'll continue to serve this community at the highest level, regardless of what happens tomorrow night or Wednesday or Friday or whenever, whenever we know what's going on. So thank you, Mayor. Same goes for all of us. And with the size of the screen, uh, Tanisha's necklace is not, it's like a subliminal message because the, there's no chance that I can see that. Um, we will go on if the tech team, if you can bring up Tom Lonergan and we can get our economic development update. Good evening, Judd, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you, sir, and thank you uh, for uh, the recognition, all of you, for uh, the success with the Novavax project. And um, it was a big win. And uh, just a, a quick thanks to Lynn Board and her team, and John Schlichting with his team, and Sharon, of course, and my team. It was a collective effort, like you said. Tom, um, Tom, before before you begin, how many how many years ago was it that that we? Uh, gave a grant that helped incentivize Novavax moving into the city? 
2012 is when okay. we awarded them uh, what was that big total for them of $150,000. Uh, maybe it was 140. It was mid 100s, but uh, nine years ago and and uh, eight years ago since you made the decision to um, effectively protect the 700 asset to ensure uh, a good tenant would arrive there one day. And there we are. Yeah, that's a whole different story. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, just one uh, item tonight. With the federal government still unable to finalize uh, another st uh, fiscal stimulus package, it was encouraging to see the state of Maryland taking its own initiative uh, to help support the economy. The governor recently announced the $250 million uh, Maryland Strong Economic Recovery Initiative, which will provide funding from the Rainy Day Fund to directly assist restaurants, small businesses, entertainment venues, arts organizations, and main streets across the state. Many of those details are still being fleshed out, but a short summary of what we know so far is that it does include a $50 million expansion of the Maryland Small Business COVID-19 Relief Grant Fund, uh, which is good news. Uh, the governor's initiative will provide a third installment of funding to that program, which uh, awards grants of up to $10,000 to businesses of 50 or fewer employees. However, uh, this additional funding will only clear the backlog of eligible previously submitted applications. And it is my understanding that no new applications will be accepted. That said, if your business or tenant had previously applied for assistance through this program and hadn't heard anything, uh, you should probably check on the status of your application. It sounds like they're gonna try to fund all of them. Uh, there's also been word that the state will provide $50 million in direct relief uh, for restaurants, uh, this initiative will provide uh, direct grants for uh, working capital, rent, equipment, sanitation services, infrastructure improvements, including HVAC systems. Uh, while eight, uh, $50 million has been set aside for this purpose statewide, it is my understanding that about $8.7 million of it will go to support Montgomery County restaurants. The funding must be distributed by no later than December 31st of this year, as of uh, last Thursday, the county had not yet set up the program's specific guidelines and an application, but it's clear that they are racing to get it done immediately, and we will get the word out about that. Uh, very quickly, a $20 million expansion of the COVID-19 layoff aversion fund is also included. That program is now accepting applications through the Maryland Department of Labor's website, and there is additional money that was added to expand the small and minority business low interest loans. Um, it's a $250 million pledge, but a remaining $100 million has only been described as emergency rapid response fund for small businesses. Uh, it's very non-descriptive, but uh, Sharon and I will continue to monitor it and uh, any other programs that might come online to support our business community. That's all I've got right now. Thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations Thank again. Thank you. Uh, tech team, if we're going to move on to ordinances, resolutions, and regulations, if you could bring up Sunil Prithviraj, uh, and we're going to talk about authorizing the city manager to amend the custodial services contract. Welcome, Sunil. Looks like you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, this is a resolution uh, of the mayor and city council authorizing city manager to amend the existing uh, custodial contract for a renewal. Pursuant of resolution R-57-14, city entered into a contract with LT Services Inc. on October 16, 2014 for the custodial services at various city facilities. At that time, they were the lowest qualified proposers. Contract was awarded for three years as a base with an option to renew for additional three years and city renewed that additional three years. The current contract with LT services expires December 1st of 2020. They have fulfilled the contract obligations, provided a good service and supported city during COVID-19 pandemic. Our initial plan prior to pandemic was to issue solicitation in July, 2020 and award a new contract. Due to uh, COVID-19, we had to revise our strategy. Based on a cost projection from International Facility Management Association, IFMA, Facility Management Institute, FMI, 
Building Owners and Managers Association, BOMA, and other facility management organizations, the cost of custodial services increased nationwide as seven to 10%. Because of COVID-19, global pandemic, city's current annual contract for custodial services is not to exceed $358,170, and $358, which remains unchanged since the contract was originally awarded in 2014. So we anticipate if we award a new contract, our custodial services will increase by 30 to 40%, and it takes about three to four months to establish a new contract. So during FY21 budget revision, city reduced overall custodial services budget by $50,000. And our custodial services contractor provided COVID-19 enhanced cleaning without cost increase. In order to meet budget requirement and also to provide safe and reliable service during pandemic recovery, and it's in the best interest of the city, we propose to extend this existing contract until June of 2021 with an option to renew June of 2022. So our proposal is that we want to evaluate what happens uh, it, during June of 2021, and we'll make a decision whether we want to extend the contract based on how this pandemic is gonna end or where we are in the pandemic recovery. So we uh, request you to authorize this amendment. Thank you, Sunil. Um, questions or comments? Rob Wu. Thanks, Mayor, and thank you, Sunil. Uh, just a, a few questions. Um, the first is, I, I would assume any extension of the contract is is um, the contractor is amenable to that, correct? That is correct. It would need to be okay. And I guess the the, the the second question is about fiscal realities. I mean, you're saying if if you recompete this, it'll be uh, projected to be thirty to forty percent higher in cost. How are these contractors performing at, at below market? What would what appear to be below market rates? Uh, it is uh, because when we awarded a contract in 2014, they were the lowest, but they had an escalation cost for a 3%, but they missed a the deadline to submit that escalation cost. So, but they kept up and uh, they continued to provide the services. So what happened uh, was, so we have increased the services in the city. So that means they're actually, we had added more hours to clean. So which uh, they're basically compensating for uh, any reduction in the cost. So that's how they are able to provide services for us. And they're also using the same staff to clean multiple buildings. So for one staff, they tend to get like eight hours rather than breaking down into smaller hours. So they're keeping one staff for a longer number of hours. Okay, so they're they're obtaining cost efficiencies through their their own management of their personnel. Is that fair? That is fair. Yes. Do we do we know about the wages that they're paying their contractors? Is it? Uh, they are paying uh, whatever the uh, minimum Montgomery County uh, the requirement is. So because we don't get involved in how much they're paying, uh, we do have an hourly rate. Um, they charge for additional services, which tend to be anywhere between $18, $18 for non-emergency and about $21 for emergency services. So we believe they do meet those minimum uh, wage requirements. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Or if someone wants to move the resolution? Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, um, Sunil may have... Uh, Reference this in his presentation, uh, but I just wanted to mention that I, you know, I had a couple of questions about this, and I was talking with Lynn about it a little earlier today. In terms of our procurement process, I understand that uh, the city manager uh, did uh, sign a memorandum, essentially authorizing this as a justifiable sole source. Uh, whether an extension of an existing agreement is a sole source contract, the same way that a new procurement would be you know, a sort of su a subject to some interpretation. But when I was reviewing the background material, I just had a question about that. And given that we've had a lot of attention paid to our procurement uh, updates uh, and our efforts to sort of modernize and professionalize our procurement processes in the last several years, 
it was just a, a pending question that I had and I don't have any problem with this. I'm going to support the resolution, but um, I just uh, wanted to mention that in our discussions, we, we did uh, confirm that the city manager did uh, authorize a justification for this extension to the extent that it's an exception to the you know, competitive procurement requirements. Uh, Tanisha and then Lorianne. Thank you uh, for raising that point, Brian. And also I would just add that as I've made my rounds through the city and been speaking with different departments, um, procurement is still a topic that we'd like to continue to mature. Uh, so we're still going through our maturation process and I think there's some more opportunities for improvement there, working collaboratively across departments on that. So that is uh, that has made my list. Uh, it's not it's not a long list, so that's good news, but uh, it, is, it is certainly on the list of, of processes and functions that we'll be reviewing and looking for some ways to find efficiencies. Uh, and so I think you'll I think Council will be pleased with some of the uh, progress that we'll make. Um, but I'll give you some more detail about that once we can dig in a little deeper. All right, so uh, like a like a scotch maturing in a cask, it is. We're going through a maturation process. Okay, Lorianne, go ahead. Thank you, sir. I was going to move the resolution unless there's some other comments. So we have a motion, do we have a second? Okay, I saw Neil's hand first. I'll second the motion. Okay, I'll call the roll. Council Member Sesma. Aye. Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. And Council Member Wu. Aye. Okay, carries unanimously. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we will move on to um, the ethics code. And this, uh, this is an ordinance to amend Chapter 7A of the city code. And Lynn Board is going to lead us in this discussion. Uh, thank you, Mayor. If the IT staff would bring up the PowerPoint, please. Thank you. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, we do have set for this evening the introduction of amendments to the, the city's ethics code. Um, our ethics code is governed by state statute as part of the Maryland public ethics law. And it does require local governments to have um, local ethics laws that are equivalent to or exceed the state requirements uh, for public officials, particularly in the areas of conflicts of interest and financial disclosure statements. The state does also provide a model ordinance for local governments to use in developing their local, um, their local ethics codes. Next slide, please. So the last time the city amended its ethics code was in 2015. Um, and since that period of time, it has been the city's position that our ordinance does comply with state law, um, specifically because there's a provision in the state law at section 5808 of the, the Maryland Public Ethics Law that allows a local government to modify the, their local election law or excuse me, ethics laws to the extent necessary to make the provisions relevant to the prevention of conflicts of interest in that jurisdiction. Um, the state ethics commission has seen it a little bit differently. Um, throughout the state, they have taken the position that if a local ethics law does not uh, pretty much exactly mirror the model, their model ordinance, the language in their model ordinance, um, they have taken the position that they do not believe it complies with the, with the state law. So we've been in a standoff for a few years on this particular issue. Um, the state has chosen not to take any enforcement action um, as a result of its interpretation. Um, you know, we do believe that the city does have an ethics, currently has an ethics law that does provide for um, a robust disclosures, uh, adequate protections from, from conflicts of interest. And we've never really in the, the, the city of Gaithersburg had an issue with um, either from our elected officials, our staff, our appointed officials, um, any ethics violation. And we strongly supported ethics um, throughout the, the history that we've had the ordinance in place, which initially went in place in the 1980s. Um, so you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, but since the city last amended its ethics law in 2015, there have been a couple areas where the state has amended the state law, particularly in the area, of, the area of the lobbyist disclosures. That's something they looked at particularly in the last two years in the legislative session. 
um, also the enforcement provisions. And then um, another issue the state's been very concerned about is the ability to have public access to financial disclosure statements. Next slide, please. So in light of um, all of these changes in the state law, the city staff has been looking at our own ethics requirement. And I do wanna remind the, the, the mayor and council, there are kind of two different standards at play here. Um, for financial interest in, and um, conflict of interest, for elected officials only, basically meaning you, the mayor and council, um, the provisions in our local law has to be equivalent to or exceed the requirements for state officials. For all other appointed officials and employees, our local ethics provisions have to be similar to the requirements for state officials and employees. So by state law, there's a heightened standard for elected officials. And um, the ordinances that the existing ordinance as well as the drafted um, modifications to the ordinance do um, have heightened requirements for elected officials. Um, next slide, please. So um, the particular amendments that are before you tonight for introduction have been uh, prepared by staff and they've been reviewed by the city's ethics commission. On October 7th, the commission did recommend the draft ordinance and um, by process, if the ordinance is adopted by the mayor and council, it then has to go to the state ethics commission, which will review the ordinance and determine whether it's in compliance with state law. That's a little bit backwards procedure. You would think they would review it before we'd adopt it, but um, that's what's uh, codified in state law. So that is the process that we will, that we will follow. So I want to uh, go through, if we go to the next slide, please go through um, some of the highlights of the proposed changes. Now, I realize this ordinance is uh, pretty dense and complicated, um, and a large part that's because we've tried to stay as, as close and as true as we can to the, the language in the state's model ordinance. Um, certainly, if I had my wishes, I would probably uh, rewrite the whole thing and try to simplify it and make it a little bit easier to understand. Um, but I think in order to get... Uh, you know, buy-in from the State Ethics Commission, we do have to keep the language pretty close to what's in the model ordinance. So the, the changes include changes to the definition section, which is 7A 1.3 of the city code, and it adds a new definition for financial interest, which is an interest in the past three years or a future of more than $1,000, and ownership of securities of more than 3% of a business entity. It also adds definition or amends the definition of interest to include definitions of qualified trusts and college savings plans. Now under this particular definition, those are exclusions from disclosures. So over the last couple of years, the state has added a couple areas um, where you no longer have to report and that would be a qualified trust or a college savings plan. Um, you might remember a few years back, they added mutual funds, which we did amend our ordinance to, to include that. So these are things that you would not have to report on your financial disclosure statement. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the state ethics law is also looking at um, adding some clarification to our existing ordinance with regard to uh, the terms and duties of our, our local ethics commission. Um, all of these changes are really in accordance with our current practice. So we've added a provision regarding the term of the commission, which is a three-year term, and that the chair is elected on an annual basis. And again, that's been the longstanding practice uh, um, for our commission. And it does provide for the retention of outside counsel in the event that my office would have a conflict of interest, which also is what we have done uh, in, in the past. Um, it does add a new provision that the Ethics Commission would be responsible for ethics training and public information um, regarding our ethics ordinance. Uh, so the commission has looked at, um, you know, if amendments pass, we would probably do a training session with the mayor and council and our applicable boards and commissions. And um, currently ethics training is provided to all city staff members. Um, the program is put on every six months. Um, but all employees are required to take the training at least um, once every two years. Next slide, please. So the, the, the meat of the changes are with 
the conflict of interest section, which is section 7A4, and then the financial disclosure provisions. And uh, under the conflicts of interest, it does add a provision um, regarding former lobbyists who become employees or officials from participating in any matter for one year that they previously lobbied on. Um, again, this is not to my knowledge ever been an issue with the with the city of Gaithersburg. I don't know if we've ever had a former lobbyist, um, you know, become an employee or elected official and then try to act on something that they formerly lobbied for. But, you know, again, state law requires us to have that provision in there, so we will include it. There are also uh, new exemptions for employment and financial interest provisions. And there's also a new provision on contingent compensation so that an official employee could not represent a party for a contingent fee for any matter involving the city. Uh, next slide, please. So additional changes to the conflict of interest um, under the gift provisions. Uh, we've long had a provision that an employee or an official cannot accept a gift from someone doing business with the city. And this clarifies that that would also include for someone seeking to do business with the city. And it adds a new provision exempting honoraria from the, the gift requirements. So they would no longer be considered gifts that would have to, honoraria would no longer be a gift that would have to be reported. Um, it does add some new provisions on prestige of office. Uh, so it would be a prohibition for, uh, for you all or any employee to influence the award of a contract, initiate a solicitation of a particular lobbyist or lobbying firm, or um, solicit campaign contributions. Um, and I do want to say that, that there are caveats on that, um, certainly for appointed officials and employees, they could not solicit, solicit campaign contributions as part of their regular duties on the job. Obviously for elected officials who are candidates, you are allowed to um, solicit campaign contributions because that's uh, how the elections work. Um, you are also as elected officials allowed to use your, your elected title um, in campaign matters, um, but for appointed officials and employees, they could not use their um, their title, nor could candidates use their title. Those candidates who are not currently elected officials could not use their title for solicitation of campaign contributions. Um, this will now be in our ethics ordinance, but it's consistent with our um, election provisions that are included in um, under both our election code as well as our election regulations. Next slide, please. Um, it does add under the financial disclosure provisions, um, it's some additional provisions dealing with candidates. It does provide that if a candidate does not file a financial disclosure statement within eight days of the due date, uh, which in our case is also the date that your petition of candidacy is due, um, that they will have been deemed to have withdrawn their candidacy and then their, their name would not appear on the ballot. Um, you know, again, we've never really had an issue with that. Um, you know, in my experience that every time we've had candidates file for office, when they file their, addition, their initial petitions and all the paperwork, they do um, file their financial disclosure statement at that time. And then it does also require that statements would be have to be forwarded, and this should say to the Ethics Commission, not the BOSC, within five days. So what would happen is once the, the BOSC receives the financial statement, it would go to the Ethics Commission within five days for ethics commission review. And again, we've uh, that's something we've always done by practice, uh, usually much faster than the five days, uh, but that would now be codified in our, in our ordinance itself. Um, it does also add provisions dealing with the, the maintenance review of disclosure statements. Um, so it would allow financial inspection of financial disclosure statements. And that is in accordance with the existing provisions of the Maryland Public Information Act. Um, there is a new provision that was just adopted this last year that does provide that home addresses would be redacted um, out of those financial disclosure statements. Uh, next slide, please. Um, some of the, the issues on this slide are issues that uh, the city has had a little bit of an issue with in the past. 
Uh, for interest in real property, our current law has been more tailored to address conflicts of interest in, in the city of Gaithersburg, uh, where we only require that you disclose real property um, interest if it's located within the city or if it was acquired uh, from someone who is doing business with the city. Uh, but now under the amended law, you would have to disclose all interests of real property wherever they are located. Uh, for interest in business, you must disclose all interest in businesses, regardless of whether or not they're doing business um, with the city, which again is a change. We had previously a little bit more narrowly tailored that um, to ensure that those disclosures related to businesses um, you know, doing that we're doing business with the city. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is another, the sources of income is another change um, where it does require disclosure of employment of immediate family members. Um, it does exempt minor children. An immediate family member would be your spouse and dependent children. Um, so if you're, you have dependent children who are not minors, you would have to disclose uh, their employment. It also requires you just to disclose whether your spouse is a lobbyist. Um, there are also some technical um, revisions dealing with interest that it clarifies that um, who, what an interest is that it's uh, the person making the disclosure. So um, if your spouse or your dependent children have an interest that's considered to be your interest. Uh, it also does provide um, an amendment that includes language that requires the Ethics Commission to review all financial disclosure statements. And again, that is certainly consistent with uh, past practice. The Ethics Commission does meet on an annual basis to review um, all financial disclosure statements uh, that are submitted. So next slide, please. There are significant changes in the enforcement provisions um, under the current law, there is a fine not to exceed $500. Uh, and there is the ability to go into court uh, for injunctive relief or to void acts that are in violation. Um, the enforcement provisions are expanded. So there's uh, for a, a late filing of a financial disclosure statement. Uh, there's a per day late fee of $5 for individuals, $10 for lobbyists. Um, for violations of the ordinance, the commission um, may issue a reprimand or recommend disciplinary action or for elected officials would be censure. Um, please note that that is a recommendation. The commission itself does not have any authority to take uh, disciplinary action or censure of an elected official. So that would be a re recommendation um, only. Um, it does expand the enforcement authority of a lobbyist and it does um, expand some of the injunctive relief to allow a court to void acts in violation of the ordinance. There are some exceptions to that. For example, a court could not um, void uh, the implementation of any tax uh, or really any financial or, or budgetary uh, action of the mayor and council. It also greatly increases the fines, again, currently, the fines for violations are up to $500. It would change to $5,000 for individuals and $10,000 for lobbyists. Next slide, please. So um, with that very detailed, sorry, <laughs> explanation uh, of the ordinance, uh, we are seeking introduction of the ordinance this evening with an anticipated public hearing date of December 7th and then anticipated policy discussion on January 4th. Um, and again, I know this is a very uh, kind of dense technical ordinance, so I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, I'm gonna start this off. I mean, I realize we're not at public hearing yet, we're just an introduction, but um, for those, for, for Mike and Ryan, you guys remember for sure, um, I've been going to bat against this, the, the sort of state overreach um, in dictating what needs to be in local ethics ordinances um, for years. Um, I, st I, I, I well, I spent uh, four or five legislative sessions 
uh, alongside Lynn, um, alongside Candace Donahoe, which by, by the way, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry. I had a conflict, otherwise I would have been at her, her retirement. Although I also wasn't, I didn't fully believe she was retiring because I've heard it a million times before. But um, we spent years uh, trying to get the, the state legislature to recognize the difference between um, their level of government and ours. Um, and, and, and really it comes down to, and you can see it, you can see this in the draft that Lynn just presented here, um, all this stuff talking about lobbyists and, uh, you know, I can't remember a single instance in which a lobbyist came before us to try to, to, try to persuade us of something. Um, the, the, there is a big difference between the, uh, the power that a, a state delegate or senator has and the power that a municipal official has. Generally, uh, for the most part, there are, there are a couple of exceptions in the state, but generally, mayors and council members don't have the ability to hire or fire. We don't do procurement, um, and we have a very limited legislative scope. Um, but what happens is there will be a, some inevitably of the 100 or what, 200 people that, that serve in the General Assembly, there'll be some transgression and somebody will stand up and say, we need to legislate so that this can never happen again. And then somebody else says, and I'll do you one better. We need to apply it to all levels of government in Maryland because we want them all to, to live up to this great standard of ethics that we are exuding at the state level. All right, as you can tell, I'm a little cynical about this because I spent all these years and couldn't, couldn't, get, couldn't get the, the legislation to try to uh, create this differential and allow municipalities to have to tailor make their ethics co um, ordinances to fit the types of potential conflicts that we do have. We did that. In fact, one of the first things I did when I came on board as a council member uh, was redraft our, our ethics code. I worked with Lynn. I, I did a lot of the writing to try to make it readable. Um, <laughs> you know, we're about to replace most of the remnants of that with something that's absolutely inscrutable, but uh, because it's dictated to us by the state and I'm just, I'm a little, I'm sorry, I'm a little resentful of this. Um, so, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not pleased about having to go in this direction. Um, and we have, and we've tried to argue our case before the state ethics commission to say, look, we've, we've taken the spirit of what you get, what, what's um, in the state law, and we've applied it uh, reasonably to uh, municipal situations to protect against conflict of conflicts of interest at our level. And they don't want to hear it. Either it matches the language in the state ordinance or it doesn't. And they're not going to approve it otherwise. It's just, it's almost like a brainless organization. At least that's the way it's been operating. Um, so I, in particular, um, I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to um, say, I can imagine a situation in which an elected official is married to somebody who is a very private person and may not want, wish to disclose publicly where they work, even if that place that they work has zero possibility of a chance of a business relationship with the city of Gaithersburg. Um, I could imagine such a situation and uh, I don't, it's, it's our goal to sort of strike the balance between disclosing what should legitimately uh, be in the, in, in the hands of the public to um, hold us accountable for, uh, for conflicts and for any other malfeasance that they, that they want to detect. But we need to strike the balance between a reasonable uh, sort of, uh, I guess, seeding of privacy for, for the elected officials or appointed officials or whoever and I think the state just doesn't want to hear it. Clearly, they don't want to hear it, and I'm annoyed by it. But at the same time, we've been going through this for years. We haven't 
the, the, the state ethics commission will not bless our ethics code. I don't, I honestly don't see another way around this. So I'm annoyed, but I will, I'm ready to hold my nose and do what the, what the will of the council is. I saw Mike's hand go up first and then we'll go to Neil. So go ahead, go ahead, Mike. So uh, Judd, you, um, you expressed all the misgivings I have about this and the, and also the awareness of the history of this. The biggest problem is there isn't one delegate or senator in Annapolis that is willing to take a, uh, to go to bat for, for us. And I think our only option is to work with MML and perhaps find someone to introduce uh, ethics uh, regulation in Annapolis that would apply to cities of less than 100,000 or something like that, so that it would be uh, so that we're not all forced cities of less than a thousand people to cities of 700,000 to comply with the same kind of cookie cutter that uh, the state ethics commission proposes us to do. Uh, I think the biggest problem with this is that the understanding that, that for some municipalities, even including a municipality the size of Maryland, the third largest city in the state, that it is not always easy to convince people or to incent people, individuals who are, uh, uh, have uh, uh, an inclination to public service to serve on our committees, com commissions and boards or even to run for elected office in the city because of the kinds of uh, the imposition of these uh, ethics requirements that are just a little bit too heavy handed. And I think you illustrated one of them as well. The, uh, the disclosure of ownership of property in another state that has nothing to do with how anyone would, would render uh, decisions as an elected official or as a commissioner or a, a member of a, a committee uh, with any kind of quasi judicial uh, role in, in managing the city. But, you know, and that's why I think perhaps what we should do is work with MML to try and introduce, get an introduction of something that would apply to uh, smaller uh, municipal governments. Uh, certainly our problems are rooted in transgressions committed at, uh, at the county level and at the city level of uh, uh, elsewhere in the state that tend to be very large large governments, local governments, and not uh, smaller uh, cities. And certainly the, the kind of ordinance that we had, I think, uh, served us well. Anyway, with that, I'm uh, willing to move introduction. I know, I'm sure my colleague Ryan, uh, and perhaps uh, Lorianne Neal and, and Rob would want to say something, but I, at that, you know, there's no more we're, we're going to have a hearing about it, so I'm willing to move the introduction of this. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I saw Neil's hand go up and then Rob's, and I will, I will just offer one correction based on a text I just received from Neil. Um, okay, we, have, we, have, we do occasionally hear from a lobbyist, because we did hear from Steve Silverman on AT&T, and um, I, I believe uh, Saul is, has a, is working through a PR person, which could be construed as a lobbyist right now too. So, um, so I'll, I'll concede that point. Neil, go right in. All right, I didn't think it was that important or I would have just brought it up in my comments, but um, in any case, uh, I, have, I have yet to be taken out to lunch or anything by a lobbyist uh, given the role that we have here. So I, I think your point, uh, your original point is still well taken. Um, and I also agree that this is a bit of an overreach in saying that smaller jurisdictions need to have as strict or stricter restrictions on this sort of thing as much larger jurisdictions. But be that as it may, uh, I, I think the, you know, the inevitable at this stage of the game is to go forward with this ordinance. The question I have for Lynn is, uh, does the, have we, has this draft covered all the ground that the state ordinance is requiring, or is there still something where we're taking a lesser stand? Yeah, this does cover um, all the requirements of the state ordinance. Um, I do wanna, based on um, both Neil and Mike's comments, do wanna just clarify, um, there is a provision in the state law that does allow the State Ethics Commission to exempt 
um, small jurisdictions from the application uh, where they, the jurisdiction wouldn't have to have any ethics law at all. Um, and they have done that. So um, there's probably, I think it's about 30% of Maryland's local governments do not have any ethics ordinance or not required to have any ethics ordinance at all. Um, the State Ethics Commission doesn't have a particular standard, but in general, they've only made that exemption for jurisdictions that have under 5,000 population or budgets of less than 2 million or less than 25 employees. Uh, but that's not their particular standard, but that's, that's generally how they've applied it. So okay. it does only apply to those very, very small jurisdictions. I'm sorry, I think my homeowners association is bigger than that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but they're not covered by this law either. Anyway, I would, uh, I think uh, at this point, I'll second Mike's introduction motion. Okay, before we go to the vote, I, I saw Rob's hand go up. Go ahead, Rob. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Lynn, for the presentation. I just had, um, I guess, three questions. The first is, you know, we, we've been discussing this uh, on and off for a while. And m my position until recently when I absconded to the private sector was, I disclose any, everything on my sent disclosures at GAO anyway, but... I remember as part of that discussion, there was something about the ramifications of not complying with the state law. And it was, I seem to recall it, it's like a, a, for lack of a better term, a shaming. Is that still the ramification or has there been some legislation recently that would be, have more ramification? Um, the state has long had the ability, um, they do what, what I refer to as the public shaming letters. Um, so uh, they do send letters to jurisdictions that are not in compliance, explaining why they're not in compliance. Um, and they do post those letters on the State Ethics Commission website. So if you go on their website today, you would see a letter posted there to the city of Gaithersburg uh, back in 2015 as to why our ordinance doesn't comply. Um, but they do have additional enforcement authorities. Uh, they could go into court and um, uh, basically get injunctive relief to force us to adopt a complying ordinance. Um, and the State Ethics Commission, you know, for many years has chosen not to take that approach. Um, I, my personal opinion, I mean, I think they recognize that there may be some merit to our argument that the state statute does allow local jurisdictions to modify their ordinances to meet local um, ethics requirements for that jurisdiction. Uh, so I think that that's part of their rationale for not taking any any jurisdiction to court that does not have a complying ordinance. Or the court could find us to be a small jurisdiction exempt from requirement. But yeah, that's true, yes. The second question is about lobbyists. So do, do we regulate lobbyists here in the city? I don't think we do. Um, there is a provision in the ordinance that does require lobbyists to be registered with the city. Um, that section, seven, sorry, I went too far in the ordinance, um, uh, 7A6, uh, where there is a, a lobbying form that they would have to fill out, which again would be reviewed by uh, the Ethics Commission. I can tell you during my 12 years here, I don't think we've ever had a lobbyist registered with, with the city. Well, so, so don't the attorneys that appear on behalf of clients advocating on any issues before the city, isn't that meet the definition of lobbying or is that a different regulated? Uh, I see Ryan nodding his head. Um, it does say that they have to expect, they have to um, expend funds on food, entertainment and gifts for officials to be a lobbyist. Um, so, I mean, I again, I'm not really sure what to, all the attorneys do with you, but um, you know, I mean, if they were, you know, taking you out, taking you out to lunch or, you know, those types of things then they would have to register as a lobbyist. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was just curious about how we would differentiate between lobbyists and non-lobbyists on any issues, but I'm guessing there is a specific particular set of individuals who are named lobbyists and required to actually register with the city. Mm -hmm. that would be Correct. Yes. And I guess the, the third question I've gotten and, and you kind of dealt with this issue with me over the past few years. It goes to kind of the information that is on disclosures. And so I had an issue a while back when I was at GAO where somebody was not happy with one of my decisions, tracked me down and got my personal information off of my uh, disclosures here and harassed city official or people on. 
are there provisions that allow for these disclosures? For example, the mayor had mentioned, um, you know, a disclosure of, of occupations that spouses might have um, that, that may not be made public or don't want to be made public, I don't know. Are there provisions that would allow for those filings to only be reviewed by the Ethics Commission and not be made public as an enforcement no. for ethics laws? The only exception, um, all disclosure statements are public. Um, somebody obviously would have to, to come in. Um, there is a provision in there that if someone would request your statement that we would notify you that they've requested your statement. The only exemption from disclosure is your home address. So all other information could be, uh, would be public. Okay, and is that an, is a state law that requires that or mandates yes. that? Okay, all right. Yes. Do we have anything from Ryan or Lori? Are we go ahead, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll just say briefly. Uh, my colleagues have already conveyed the tortured history of this issue, um, and you know, while I'm sympathetic to the concerns that have been raised and have and have been raised over the years, we're at the point now where we've litigated these issues with the state for a number of years, and state laws have been passed and they are what they are after we've tried to have them amended um, or have, you know, draft legislation um, changed to accommodate some of our concerns. And so I think, like Neil said, we're sort of at the point where um, even though we may have some reasonable concerns and objections about it, it's a state mandate. And, um, you know, Lynn and her staff have, have, have done the best they can to uh, meld uh, our uh, ethics laws with the requirements of the state and uh, given all the restrictions that the state law puts on us. And uh, I think at this point, you know, we underscored that we're really just deciding about introduction at this point. We're not making a final decision. There'll be time for further debate and comment from the public that it makes sense to just move forward with it at this point, even if some of us are moving forward reluctantly uh, and even if it's unfortunate that some of our colleagues at the state level haven't been able to uh, internalize uh, the merits of our concerns, we are where we are at this point after many years, and I think we need to move forward. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Lorian, do you want to say anything or should we just go to the vote? We can go to the vote. I mean, a lot of the concerns have already been raised. Um, I do think some of the um, uh, Penalties for violations are uh, uh, definitely um, excessive um, based on what we've had in the past, um, what was what's currently in the language now. So um, I look forward to uh, hearing other comments from the public uh, when this goes to um, the public hearing. So. You know why they're way out of scale, Lorian? Because they were designed to ap apply to the state level and not to the municipal level. Yeah. It, it just add that to the list of examples of what is wrong. Anyway, we have a motion. We have a second. Um, I will call the roll. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. Council Member Sesma. This is to introduce Council Member Sesma. Yes, this is only to introduce for the purpose of the hearing to discuss all these things. Aye. Okay, Council Member Harris. Aye. Council Member Spiegel. Aye. Council Member Sales. Aye. Council Member Wu. Aye. Okay, it is introduced. Thank you, Lynn. Um, next, we have staff guidance. And I, tech team, if you could bring up uh, Dennis Enslinger and Kirk Eby to talk about the boundary options uh, for Gaithersbury Elementary School number eight and maybe any update on this uh, delay that MCPS has now put on the table for this boundary study. Take it away, Dennis. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Tonight, we are seeking guidance on submitting comments related to the proposed elementary school number eight boundary study. Uh, I wanted to thank Kirk Eby for his analysis of the boundary study options uh, that are discussed in the memo uh, found in your packet on page 49. We're grateful again, for that too, Dennis. Kirk, thank you very much. Again, each of the options represent a reasonable approach to reducing enrollment in the elementary schools that are over capacity in the Gaithersburg cluster, which is one of the reasons that the school is being constructed. 
In addition, each of the options provides opportunities uh, for residents to walk to each of the elementary schools and to the associated middle schools. While none of the four options creates a perfect balance of all the factors, um, staff believes that option three provides a better balance of the factors um, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it takes advantage of the walk sheds for each of the schools in the Gaithersburg cluster, both elementary and uh, middle school. In addition, option three appears to limit the number of busing challenges uh, for students living south of the CSX Railroad. And finally, it probably does the best job in reducing kind of enrollment numbers at the associated elementary schools. Uh, for instance, Summit um, Hall Elementary is down to about 94% capacity um, in the 25-26 school year and reduces enrollment of the Gaithersburg and Rosemont schools uh, to nearly about 100% uh, for each of those schools. And they're currently over capacity um, quite a bit uh, for both uh, Summit Hall Elementary in particular. I um, mean, throughout the years, the council has supported additions or improvements to both uh, Gaithersburg Elementary and Summit Elementary uh, with the construction of the new school uh, number eight, uh, some of those would be alleviated in terms of the capacity issues. In terms of making some minor changes that we might suggest to Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, Kirk did a great job of uh, looking at the overall balance of some of these items. Again, the report that the, uh, the school district gets into is a little bit more detailed in terms of minutia of the demographics of students. We didn't get down to that level we looked at the larger big ticket items. Um, in your packet on pages 4, 54 and 55 are some of the changes that we might suggest um, to the school district. Um, one of them would be, we might see an improvement of the overall balance if sub area GA1B, which includes Audubon Square, if it was reassigned to Gaithersburg Elementary and to Gaithersburg Middle School. Um, an alternative might be to look at uh, GA6, which is splitting Frederick Avenue and sending the area, uh, which is west and south of Frederick Avenue to the new middle school. Um, it might help balance those enrollments a little bit better. Um, so that's kind of staff's review of all the options. I'm happy to go into the options and Kirk's here also, if you wanna get more specific about one particular option or another. Um, Mayor, as you noted, um, the original Montgomery County Public Schools resolution regarding the study boundary, which was approved in November of 2020, um, set a date of adoption of the superintendent's recommendation for March uh, 2021, uh, which will be coming up. There's been some discussion that the superintendent is looking to move that date. Um, I would assume they would need to revise their resolution they approved back in November. Um, we don't really have a, any more information about um, why they are choosing to do that. We've asked a few questions and are hoping to get some response uh, regarding the idea of moving the actual recommendation approval date by the board. I think um, we will get some more detailed information and Dennis and I didn't have a chance to uh, connect before the meeting on this. I did have a call earlier today with the superintendent, the deputy superintendent and the chief of staff, um, just as a meet and greet call, of course, brought up this issue to try to get some more clarification. As he explained to me, they are still planning to continue the schedule as it's set, including presentation of the final recommendation um, in, in February or March, I believe but they will be asking at that time for the Board of Education to delay their action until the fall due to the um, decline in enrollment, um, which they believe is related to COVID-19, uh, but there's no way to know that at this point. And so he feels that waiting until they have fall numbers uh, to finalize the recommendation is, is, what, is what he's wanting to do. So, the timeline sort of stays the same, but the final action, he will be asking the board to delay their final action. 
um, we talked a bit about if that impacts from his perspective construction or anything along those lines. He did not think so. He also didn't think that it would ultimately um, drastically impact any of the recommendations related to the study. They just want to be more cautious. We didn't have a lot of time today. And so I'm hoping, and I know that we've asked some more points at questions of them. So I'm sure we'll get some more information that we may be able to share soon. Thank you, Tanisha. Um, I, so um, the, the timing of this news about the potential uh, delay in the final decision, um, that just happened, so we, we couldn't get answers on that, but we'll look forward to that, and hopefully there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing on the face of it that that seems uh, worrisome to me, but, you know, it's, we have the potential for a really uh, good set of options here, and, um, and I agree with staff's recommendation uh, in terms of the option we should advocate for, but the fact is when uh, when I initially looked at all of the options, um, I was pleased and say it, it, essentially there's there's gradations of from uh, very good to great to extremely great like to ideal. I mean like there's there's no real terrible option that they've even put on the table here. All would maximize walkers, which would uh, which would guarantee that people nearby the school um, are going to be boundaried into that school, and 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 they all um, leave open the the option, which I'm hoping that they will move forward on, of rezoning or or, or redrawing the boundary for Forest Oak Middle School, and essentially redressing uh, a sore point for many in the community that's gone on for 20 years plus. Um, so it all seemed really good and and you know I guess my perspective is I'd like them to put that in etch it into stone as soon as as soon as possible. Um, any other comments I see Neil go ahead Neil. Sure thank you mayor and thanks everyone for your good work and comments on this already. Um, so I want to say that when I looked at, looked this over after you, Mayor, uh, let me know about the uh, the proposals. I also thought number three looked like the best option for the reasons that uh, that Dennis and Kirk have uh, pointed out. Um, on the other hand, just looking at the numbers is probably not the uh, only approach. I think uh, if we're going to make a recommendation to MCPS, I'd like to couch it as saying that, you know, any recommendation based on the numbers is pending feedback from the PTAs and other affected people to see if there's some overriding reason why there's some factor that we're not seeing in the numbers that should be taken into account. Because as you said, Mayor, all four options are certainly a great step forward and meet most of the requirements that we had coming in. Uh, uh, option three does look like the best one on the face of it, but there may be some some reason why one of the other options makes more sense because of some reasons that are not uh, are not immediately visible to us. So um, I'm I'm somewhat disturbed, not probably not surprisingly, by the delay potential delay in moving this forward to final, finalization on the basis that you know what we've heard is the reason that they're thinking of pushing off a final decision is because of the change of enrollment, but the change of enrollment in COVID has been kind of not just a Montgomery County issue, but it's been across multiple jurisdictions. And it's relatively small. I think it's about a 2% decline in enrollment. Probably people sending their kids to private school that are remained open or some, some other method. But at any rate, it doesn't seem like, a, given the magnitude of the overcrowding situation in our schools and in the county in general, 2% is probably not enough to change anybody's mind in how this is this specific project is going to go forward. So um, I hope that we can have conversations with MCPS and find out if there's more to the story. Um, because given the whole situation that we've been through through the last several years and the long history of this situation for this neighborhood, I think we'd, we'd want to wrap this issue up sooner than later. That's it for me. Thanks. Thanks. Neil. We'll go to Mike. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm. Uh, I find the uh, the rationale for the delay, based on a 
you know, maybe a 2% reduction in enrollments a little bit uh, um, curious, I guess that's the word to use. Uh, I agree with Neil and I agree with you, uh, Mayor, that uh, we got, we have four very good alternatives, I think, uh, and certainly the one that, that staff has recommended is the one that I saw as as the uh, the best possible alternative. I think the biggest problem here is that MCPS started in a whole uh, in terms of trust from the community uh, in the process. Uh, you know, when they delayed the boundary discussion and then restarted it, they still failed to notify the communities that would be affected or presumably would be affected. Uh, and then uh, somehow still managed to come up with the uh, with uh, three different op four different options that uh, suit our needs, but perhaps uh, might have been shaped a little bit differently with some uh, larger public input. So I think, and then to talk about delaying it again, the final decision I think just uh, diminishes any uh, uh, confidence that uh, from these communities that have already been burned. Uh, so even though we got to the right place or the place we think is uh, going to be the right option for, for Gaithersburg and these neighborhoods, uh, there's still a lot of suspicion and uh, MCPS hasn't done a, a good job of allaying that. Uh, and further by saying that we're gonna delay the final decision because we got to look at some numbers that I think uh, on the face of it aren't, aren't the, isn't a strong justification for or why this decision is going isn't going to be finalized earlier in, in the process. So um, I, I'll be interested to hear the reaction of the neighborhoods and the school communities, and that's certainly uh, uh, Neil's dis, uh, suggestion that the the PTA communities, uh, the school communities, need to be involved and engaged now that we have some options here to discuss. That's that's going to be very important. So. Um, but uh, I support staff's recommendation at this point. But you know, with the, with this history that we're working with, and the fact that it hasn't changed much in terms of how MCPS deals with uh, with these neighborhoods and school communities, uh, is is disappointing. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Any any other comments, council members? Okay, not seeing any. Then. Um, Okay, Ryan Spiegel. I did just want to briefly go on record as saying that I agree with what my colleagues have said without beating a dead horse here. You know, there are concerns about a little bit of slowdown in this process, although we also understand we're in unprecedented times. Um, but I am cautiously optimistic that we will be able to continue to move forward and work together with MCPS and, and the communities on this. I do want to underscore that I think all four of the options presented, while each is not perfect and has some issues, you know, they do uh, go, uh, they do go quite a, quite a distance in resolving some uh, long held problems um, that, you know, certainly came to light and were debated uh, over the last year um, within the city. Um, but I do support the recommendations of staff. Councilmember Wu, go ahead, Rob. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll just go on the record too with, uh, I deplore violence against our equine friends and I'm, I'm cool with the discussion today. Lorianne, you good? Yes, I will just echo the sentiments of my colleagues. Um, I agree this isn't a perfect fix for uh, what we intended, but Hopefully they will uh, uh, continue in the process with uh, prioritizing what we've um, asked for, which is um, uh, ensuring that the new school is uh, accessible by the uh, communities um, where the school would be going um, and that we're prioritizing walkers. Um, I had hoped that the middle school would have uh, been included in this study. Um, and I just hope that MCPS is going to do their due diligence in ensuring um, outreach happens um, early 
with all of the surrounding impacted communities. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Lorraine. So, Dennis, do you, it seems like everyone's pretty much in concert here on agreeing with the staff recommendation. Um, pending, you know, maybe we can privately do some outreach to PTAs uh, impacted and say if, ask them if they want to. Um, send anything to the city about our position uh, per, per uh, Neil's suggestion. And I'm, I'm happy to help with that. I'm sure council members are happy to help with that. Do you, is that good for you, Dennis? Yeah, I think that works. Um, we could make some comments that we hope that they hold to the March 2021 kind of approval date also in our comments. Um, I also wanted to let the public know you know, kind of as a portion of this, the Planning Commission, the Gaithersburg City Planning Commission will be having a courtesy review uh, with the exception of the Forest Con, which we would have regulatory authority over uh, for the site plan uh, for the, the school at Kelly Park, uh, number eight um, on November 4th, this Wednesday. Mayor, I would just add that in addition to you giving um, the city their feedback and comments, the record is still open for the community PTA groups, community groups to comment directly uh, to MCPS on, on the boundary study. And so we wanted to make sure we encourage that as well. Excellent point. Uh, Neil, go ahead. So oh, just a quick point looking for some clarification. I thought that when I looked over the, um, the plan two weeks or three weeks ago in October, um, that there were uh, a set of four optional recommendations for the middle school districting as well, right? Are we going to make a recommendation on that or? It, where that? Yeah, it's all inclusive actually in the boundary study. Okay. The, the, the elementary school. schools uh, feed into the middle schools. And so the, each option has the recommendations for each middle school also. And again, option three is probably the best choice. Um, All right, I just wanted to make sure that we were that, that was it, in fact the case. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, thanks, Dennis and Kirk. Uh, next is from the city attorney. And nothing additional this evening. Okay, Dennis. Any anything from other staff? Oh, we we Dennis just went away. So I'm assuming if he had something from other staff, he would have said so. Um, before we send him away. So with that, um, oh, here comes Dennis. I, Dennis. Do, not, I do not have free. Okay, we brought you here and you don't have any. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, please, please join us. Encourage your friends and neighbors from all, any part of the city, all parts of the city next week for our council, our virtual council in the communities. And again, take note, it starts at 7 p.m. Our, our regular mayor and council meetings generally start at 7.30. This starts at seven to give us an extra time for uh, presentations and back and forth with, with our staff. Um, then the next uh, regular meeting of the mayor and council is on Monday, November 16th. And until then, let's do great things, Gaithersburg. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>